introduce Greg Ward, the Nuclear Fuel Cycle Royal Commission. Greg has a career in the military as a naval officer and a helicopter pilot in economic development in the state government and in the private sector in, in operations and management. Greg is the Chief of Staff of the Nuclear Fuel Cycle Royal Commission. The final report uh, from the Nuclear Fuel Cycle Royal Commission was delivered to the South Australian Government for its consideration in May of this year. Greg will discuss with us today the contents of this report um, and some of the meanings and the ramifications of, of the things that the uh, report has um, brought forward. There'll be time, um, I assume, maybe perhaps during or certainly after Greg's presentation uh, for questions from the floor. So can we please welcome Greg Wall. Thank you, and um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, present to you today. Um, I'd like to uh, keep this fairly informal um, if, if you wish. I do have a, a series of slides that we'll talk through here and we're going to cover a, a fairly broad range of topics. So I'm more than happy for you to interject and ask questions as we go. Um, I just request that we try and stick to the topic of the slide because we'll probably get on to uh, some of the other questions later on. Um, I had an hour, I think, and probably now 50 minutes, I guess, given uh, the, the slide before this. Um, but um, I, I'm happy to, uh, to address any questions or um, talk at length on any, uh, any topic that we cover uh, today. So first of all, uh, I guess you, you're probably aware of the fact that the, uh, the government established a Royal Commission to investigate um, the opportunities and the risks associated with greater involvement in the nuclear fuel cycle. Um, that Royal Commission was uh, established in March last year and we've spent about 14 months um, thoroughly investigating pretty much every aspect of the uh, nuclear fuel cycle over that period, um, trying to, uh, to really understand the, the evidence that underpins the variety of views out there um, in relation to this um, um, interesting emotive topic in, in some, some ways. Um, so the Royal Commission uh, went through a, a, a process of uh, <coughs> gathering its information. We, uh, in the very early days, we put out a, uh, a, a series of issues papers around aspects of the, uh, the fuel cycle, and we requested uh, from the uh, broader public um, submissions in relation to that, uh, those issues papers. Um, in parallel with that, we, uh, we were undertaking our own internal research, we um, undertook a number of site visits around the world, so we visited um, a variety of countries to, to look at um, their experiences in the, in the nuclear fuel cycle. And um, we also then uh, conducted a series of public sessions, which we, uh, we invited witnesses um, that was streamed live over our, um, our, our website we basically did a deeper dive into various areas where we, we thought we needed more information. Uh, we re released our tentative findings, which was the uh, consolidation of our views at that point in time, in February this year. Um, spent about a week bolting around the community to, uh, to try and explain those uh, tentative findings. And then we opened it up for, um, for feedback for a period of five weeks. Um, and it was feedback in relation to those two of the findings. The final report was, uh, as was mentioned, was presented to the government um, on the 6th of May uh, this year. Um, shortly after that, the government established a, a separate agency to consider the findings from the, uh, the Commission's report and to uh, determine what they need to do uh, with the recommendations arising from that report. And the primary role of that, that separate agency is to, over the next six months, engage widely with the, the community in a, in a number of different forums to try and explain uh, what the report said and, and zone in some of the recommendations, basically um, continue the discussion with the um, South Australian community to see 
at the end of that process where there's where there's sufficient will within the community to take this further or not. Um, so what is the uh, <coughs> nuclear fuel cycle? Um, in essence, um, we were asked to look at um, the various elements of the nuclear fuel cycle. And if I start um, in the green um, bubble on the left-hand side there, um, it was to look at um, exploration and mining of radioactive materials. So predominantly uranium, we looked at thorium, we looked at some other um, um, potential um, uh, radioactive uh, materials. Uh, clearly in South Australia, we, uh, we're, we're already involved in mining uranium and we export uh, that around the world. So this was about looking at whether or not the processes uh, that, that underpin that activity were adequate, whether there needed to be any changes there, and whether there was any scope to increase the level of exploration and, and mining and milling. Um, in Australia, all we do um, is dig the uranium out of the ground, turn it into uh, yellow cake, which is really just um, pretty much um, not much different to, to how it comes out of the ground, a little bit more um, uh, milled. But um, we put that in in 44 gallon drums and we ship it overseas for others to add value to that, uh, that oil. So the uh, Second element that we were asked to look at was the uh, up here, the blue bit, was whether there was any opportunity to further process that uh, that yellow cake, whether um, we could add value to that ore by converting it, uh, enriching it, or fabricating it into uh, fuel assemblies for uh, nuclear power plants. Um, they're, they're, they're three distinct um, processes, but you have to go through each one of those uh, steps in order to produce the fuel that powers nuclear power stations. So the act of conversion is essentially taking that yellow cake and converting it into a gas. Um, you then take that gas and run it through um, the factory full of uh, centrifuges to try and enrich um, that gas to increase the, the, the level of concentration of a particular um, uranium um, isotope so that it can um, sustain a nuclear reaction in a, in a power plant. So when, when the ore comes out of the ground, um, the um, isotope of interest, which is uranium-235, is only about 0.7% of the ore. So the process of enrichment increases that uh, concentration up to about 5%. Now, if you really um, wanted to uh, militarise this, which is the other extreme, then you would need to increase that enrichment, that, that uh, concentration up to around 90%. But for, uh, for powering um, nuclear power plants, you need about 5% uh, concentration, and that's what <coughs> that process of enrichment does. Um, it's then created into uh, these small pellets, just small hard uh, pellets, which are put into long, thin zirconium tubes, which are put together into a, an assembly, and that's called a fuel assembly. And the process of doing that is um, called uh, fuel fabrication, which is the last step. Um, all, all of those processes are essentially um, chemical and manufacturing uh, processes pretty typical of um, what we already do in Australia. Um, not highly radioactive or anything like, like that. It's, it's largely managing uh, chemical processes and manufacturing processes. <coughs> but the end result is uh, these fuel assemblies, which are then used in the next, uh, next phase of the cycle, which is to generate electricity. So we were, we were required to look at uh, whether or not it made sense um, building nuclear power plants in South Australia in order to supply some of our future um, electricity needs. Uh, in, in essence, a, a 
nuclear power plant is essentially uh, a big kettle. Um, the, the nuclear part of the process is really there just to uh, heat water, which then drives the turbines. Uh, it's a very similar process to um, a coal plant, for example, which is designed to heat the water, which drives the, um, the, uh, the power plant. Can I just ask a question? Sure. When you looked at the electric <coughs> generation, did you <coughs> to look next to a desalination plant? Because South Australia has a, it's not known for its water, and we've got a white elephant sitting down there somewhere, that this way would have been cheaper to produce water, and it might have been more beneficial. We, we did. Um, as we got into it, we, we started looking at um, um, alternative uses, not just um, generating power, but it could have been generating power to run a desalination plant. It could have been producing heat to run other industrial uh, processes. So we, we did look at a, a variety <coughs> of the potential other uses of um, um, the heat or the power that came out of a, a nuclear power plant. But um, we, we, we didn't we didn't go into great detail. In so I was just going to ask, in your cycle, uh, export of the rods or leasing of the rods doesn't seem to feature in the... In other words, it seems to be even just purely within the country. No, well, I'll, I'll, I'll get to all that in a minute. Um, but that's a good point. We'll, we will talk about this. <coughs> so, Chris, while you're on, while you're on um, electricity generation, did you go anywhere past uh, you know, electrical power generation then to possibly other applications like, like submarine? Um, no, so just to be really clear, our terms of reference um, basically um, forbid us to look at military uh, applications of this. So we were, we were simply looking at whether or not there were um, <coughs> opportunities and risks for that matter. So we, we had to look at both, both sides of the equation uh, for civil uh, civilian type uh, applications, specifically not uh, military applications. Is there any difference uh, in terms of handling between the yellow tape and the rod? Um, yes, there is. I mean, the, the yellow tape basically is a, a, a yellow powder, um, and it's put into essentially, <coughs> it, or keep it simple, 44 gallon drums, which are sealed and just shipped around the world in, uh, in containers, uh, typical shipping containers. The, the rods themselves are, are highly uh, manufactured. They're precision uh, uh, products. And you do have to be quite careful with the handling of them because they, if you damage them, then, then you know, you know, that can create problems in the, uh, the reactors themselves. Um, they're not overly radioactive or anything like that. So, um, you know, the, in fact, I think the uh, yellow cape is probably marginally more um, radioactive than the um, the actual fuel cells before they go into uh, a, a power station. So really, it's about just handling them with care, <coughs> and, and probably not tr trying to avoid shipping them great distances in, uh, in bad conditions because uh, if you don't want really to damage them. Um, so power generation, we talk more about that. Uh, once the, uh, the fuel rods come out of the reactor, though, so they've been used, they usually, um, they can stay in the reactor for two to five years. So they generate, for, for, for such a small um, amount of uh, material, they generate um, an enormous amount of um, energy over a long period of time, which is, a, which is one of the real advantages of it. So you know, a few years after it's been in the reactor doing its job, those fuel cells are, are taken out because they're essentially less efficient at that point. Um, <coughs> at that point, however, they are very hot uh, and they are quite radioactive. So that's when you really have to start to be uh, careful. And we'll talk a lot more uh, a little bit later about um, what that means and you know, how they cool down and decay. And, uh, but there's a couple of things that you can do with those, uh, those rods afterwards. 
Um, some countries actually take them and reprocess them. So they put them into a big factory, they basically melt them down, and they separate the, uh, the elements to reuse a lot of the uranium that's still in those, uh, those fuel rods that, haven't, that hasn't been used. To put it into context, the used fuel is about 4% uh, waste products, and the, the other 90 odd percent is uranium, uh, pretty close to natural uranium. So, you know, you could take that and reuse it, and, and that's what this, uh, this reprocessing uh, process is just trying to do. But it's a, an enormously um, complex and expensive process. Um, and in simple terms, it's, uh, it's much cheaper to dig more uranium out of the ground um, than to reprocess this stuff and essentially produce new, uh, new rules. How many countries so, are reprocessing? Sorry? How many countries are reprocessing? Um, th there are a couple. Uh, the, the experts of this, I guess, would be the French. Um, countries <coughs> ship some of the, well, some countries ship their uh, used fuel to France to reprocess. Um, France then sends them back. Um, um, it could be fuel rods. Uh, they will ship them back there. Um, the, the, the waste component of it, which is in a vitrified form. Um, the, U uh, the UK uh, reprocesses, although it's about to shut down its uh, reprocessing facilities, it hasn't really operated the way they expected it. Um, the Russians reprocess. Um, the Chinese are talking about taking French technology to do to reprocessing. Um, and um, I've missed one. Yes. Oh. No, the US doesn't so much. Um, they, they do um, on, on, a, on a small scale, but, but more for um, research and other purposes. The, um, the, the Japanese have been in the process of <coughs> trying to get a reprocessing facility working for a long time and they haven't been particularly successful, so it's not a um, But in essence, it goes one of two ways. You reprocess, you use it, and then eventually at some point, it needs to be stored or disposed of. And that's, that's this, this part of it. Does it have any alternative reference to consider the fact that as uh, we have a huge amount of solar power available to us, and even if Uh, no, but um, clearly we needed to understand the market where um, electricity generation was going. We needed to understand um, what the world's actions in relation to climate change uh, would likely be and whether or what, what impact that would have potentially on nuclear power. So we did, we did and I can talk a lot more about that in a, in a minute. Um, so the... Uh, the storage thing we'll talk about, and then finally, uh, clearly there's a, there's a lot of research, training, education, um, development work that goes on. <coughs> Just a question back on the reprocessing you're talking about, um, and you, you explained it's very expensive and it's very technical. If it does work though, does it eliminate waste? Because you can keep reprocessing it and putting it back in it. If, if, if that can be done well, costly though it might be, does that process no. eliminate waste? No. What? What it? So no. Even even after running through this process once or twice, it doesn't <coughs> eliminate waste. There is still a waste stream that has to be managed. It's it's the it's the nasty stuff that, that is not of any use that is basically extracted. You still have to <coughs> dispose of it in some way. Uh, what it does do is reduce the volume potentially. And, and I guess you then also extract more value out of the, uh, the resource. Yeah. In general terms, <coughs> if we did have uh, a power plant generated uh, by rock fuel rods, how many fuel rods are you looking at? Yeah. Oh, in, in a in a reactor. Yeah. In a, yeah. Well, that, that depends on how big the reactor is, but you know you might have um, I don't know, 20, 40 uh, rods. These rods are about that. that but you, you, you replace them all the time, so yeah. you continually be uh, 
taking the elements out from the ones. I'm just trying to get a handle on, you know, eventually what we're looking at for quantity. Well, I can talk about that. I'll talk about that. Now. So, moving on. Um, what did the Commission find? Uh, with respect to uh, uh, exploration and, and mining, uh, we found that the existing frameworks and, uh, and processes are generally uh, adequate to address the risks um, associated with exploration and mining. Uh, we found that the um, expansion of uranium mining in uh, South Australia would provide some additional benefits to the, um, to the economy. However, they would be minor benefits. They weren't going to be game changers. At the moment, we probably generate about $350 million a year from that activity. Um, it might increase to about eight, $900 million a year um, you know, by 2030. But you know, it's, it's, it's not earth-shattering. It's not going to change the, um, the, the economy uh, greatly. Um, we did find that there was some um, uh, opportunity to simplify the approvals process. At the moment, there's duplication. You know, there's federal and state activities that sort of do the same thing. So, um, the, the whole process could be simplified a little bit. Um, there's a lot of geological data that's um, developed through this exploration process. Um, that could be much better integrated and shared. Um, so we, we made some recommendations about trying to, uh, to consolidate and integrate that, that information and make it more widely available. Um, <coughs> we thought there was some benefit in encouraging um, further exploration, not just uh, for for uranium, which is our focus, but um, I guess this will not more broadly to um, the, the mining sector in the state. Um, and the other key recommendation was that if we do do this, then let's make sure that um, we, we, we get sufficient funds um, <coughs> that are um, that are, that are ring-fenced um, for remediation at the end of the, end of the process. Um, further processing. In essence, as I said, the risks here were, uh, were quite manageable. Um, chemical manufacturing type activities uh, more than capable of doing that in the state. Um, however, uh, particularly s since Fukushima, there's been a wind back clearly in, uh, in nuclear power around the world a little. We'll talk about that later as well. But we found that the, the value adding to this process uh, is oversupplied. It's about 20% oversupplied at the moment. The barriers to getting involved in, in that are quite high. Um, it's a small club, they're well established. Um, so we couldn't see any compelling reason that would give South Australia some advantage um, in establishing a conversion or a fabrication or an enrichment facility in the current market. Now, where that might change, and we'll, we'll talk about this, is the fuel leasing uh, component here. If, if, we, if we are able to link that front end process to a solution for the, for the back end, which is the, the waste storage and disposal component, then there may be some advantage um, in, uh, in what we call a, a process called fuel leasing that would potentially give us an advantage and attract um, manufacturers in that front end process. But it's a long way down the track. You really have to get the back end sorted out before you convince anybody to get um, too involved in the front end. Um, and this this is not likely. This oversupply is not likely to change between now and about the mid 2020s at the at, at the earliest. Um, we do have a cyclotron here in South Australia over at Samri, uh, which is used for the production of. Um, radioisotopes for medical imaging and the like. Can you tell me what family is, please? Um, it's, it's the medical, yeah. I won't try. South Australian something or medical, or medical or health and medical research institute. It's, 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 it's a, uh, yeah, it's, it's a medical research uh, facility. The, 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 and the cyclotron, and I'll get onto that in a minute too, is um, basically a contraption. 
scientific. Yeah, so yeah, I'm being quite scientific here. Um, that uh, it doesn't use um, radioactive materials uh, so much, but, it, but the end uh, product is radio um, isotopes. And those isotopes are used in um, medical imaging, uh, medical um, uh, processes, particularly for treating cancers and the like. Um, and, and that facility is new, it's underutilised, and we thought there was some opportunity there to actually invest a bit more in that and, um, and um, get more out of it. But it was a, that was a side one. Um, is it government owned, is it? It is. Yes, yes, it's the... No, no, but it, it, it does produce radioactive waste, um, um, and clearly the stuff that you, you put inside you is quite radioactive as well, the imaging um, and the, the medical treatment. Um, if I quickly get on to electricity, um, but what, we, what we found that... Um, that the, the, the current um, uh, energy market in, in Australia is going through some challenges. Um, we found that the power sector uh, will require some changes. Um, we are part of a, uh, a national electricity grid, so we <coughs> exchange power with Victoria and New South Wales and Queensland and Tasmania. Um, but the market rules, as they currently apply, um, uh, penalise to some extent um, baseload producers. And nuclear power is a baseload producer. It, once you turn it on, it just keeps going and it keeps producing power. Um, unlike, say, renewables, which are um, not baseload, they're dead. The now for salt uh, transfer of heat overnight. There's no so, excuse now not to use renewables. Well, we'll talk about that. We'll, Sorry. We'll, we, we, started, <laughs> we, we looked very closely at, uh, at all this, and I'm not trying to say that renewables are bad here or anything. So, um, but renewables are intermittent. When the wind stops blowing, it doesn't produce power. So, and, and the current rules basically, if the wind is blowing, then, then um, the, the renewable energy is dispatched first, so that's what we use, and the base <coughs> load, uh, uh, power plants basically um, can't sell their, their power. So in, in that sense, uh, they're being forced out of the market, and we've seen that happen with the, uh, the coal power uh, plant in Port Augusta, and we've seen it with some of the gas uh, plants um, out of um, Tom's Island and that sort as well. Um, that, that does create some, uh, some <coughs> issues. Um, we'll, I've got a slide in a minute just to show you what impact that does have on South Australia. But um, we're also moving towards a low carbon um, um, electricity. Um, network. And, and we're going to be progressively um, forced down that path as the world starts to grapple more with um, managing <coughs> global warming and the, the impacts of climate change. Um, and Paris, as, as we're all aware, which um, the, the, the most recent um, uh, climate uh, conference in Paris um, established that the world would, would actively seek to maintain um, Carbon emissions, oh sorry, um, global warming to below two degrees with a uh, target of trying to keep it within a uh, one and a half degree uh, increase. Um, at the moment though, all the, uh, the countries around the world have proposed what they're going to do to address that. And on the basis of that, um, you know, I, even if the world does do what it says it's going to do at the moment, um, the predictions of what's going to happen with the global temperature uh, somewhere between a rise of 2.7 or up to 4 degrees. So clearly more work has to be done if the world is to achieve um, the targets that it set itself. So we, we looked at that uh, in the context of nuclear power and whether that meant a nuclear power had some role in the future. It, nuclear power is a low carbon um, electricity producer, unlike, say, coal or gas. Um, renewables 
clearly is a uh, low carbon uh, producer. So oh, sorry, it's just you call it low carbon, it is no carbon. Isn't it? Yeah. Well, well, essentially, once it's running, it's no carbon. That's right. <coughs> um, so, with this in mind, what we found was that a, a nuclear power plant in South Australia was not commercially viable um, under the current market rules. Um, a big baseload uh, supplier like that could not compete. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to convince a commercial organisation to come in here and build a nuclear power plant in South Australia, particularly um, under the current rules. Now, we acknowledge that those rules have to change, but whether that would actually change um, the, the circumstances for nuclear power, it's still would still be uncertain. Um, and Australia does have um, abundant um, renewable opportunities, but there are still some challenges. Uh, we still have to solve um, the problem with grid battery uh, storage, for example, because that is what uh, would assist renewables in, in overcoming some of the intermittency of the issues that they have, and would also assist the, um, the network's stability and, and, and a bunch of other issues. Um, so we found that it wasn't viable. Um, however, we did find that, it, that nuclear power does have um, a role to play in reducing carbon emissions uh, into the future. Now, whether that's in Australia or elsewhere in the world, um, that was the question. Um, we were of the opinion that uh, if the world is moving and Australia is moving towards a low carbon um, uh, energy system, that there should be three primary principles here. The first one should be that it is, uh, the generators should be low carbon. That the system itself needed to be reliable. You, know, you can't have the go out and um, regularly on you. And that we should be trying to do that at the lowest possible um, uh, cost in the process. So that meant that we should be uh, technologically neutral in terms of the, uh, the, the types of systems that we had available to us. Yes? Why would you choose to use nuclear power, which of course is a intergenerational legacy of waste radioactive, radioactive material from many, many, many hundreds of years, hundreds of thousands of years, okay. even the half-life of uranium? And not only that, with the increased terrorist activity around the world, power stations become an immediate threat. Well, I'm about to deal with all that in a minute. Oh, oh. And for the danger of somebody dropping a bomb on them. Okay, I understand where you're coming from, um, and I'll deal with each one of those issues as we go down the trail. Okay. Um, so, yeah, um, nuclear power not viable in, uh, in South Australia. That's not to say that uh, nuclear power wouldn't be viable in other areas. Uh, throughout Australia. We didn't assess that. Um, just a quick one on, on uh, the impact on our wholesale prices. So this was uh, some of the modelling that, that um, uh, came out of our, our research. I mean, if you just have a quick look at this, um, what this is showing <coughs> us at the moment is um, wholesale electricity prices in different states uh, under the current policies. And what it basically says here is the top line there is South Australia. At the moment, we are about 20% more expensive than the, the other states that, that, are, that are part of that. <coughs> um, and, it's, and it's a feature of the market rules I talked about before and also um, some of the unique characteristics in South Australia. I mean, we have roughly 40% of our, uh, our powers generated by uh, renewables. We have a small interconnector to um, Victoria, which supplies uh, baseload dirty coal um, electricity, and we've shut down a number of our own baseload stations. So there's a whole bunch of reasons why that happens. Um, what we assumed in our modelling is that uh, around 2030, if there was the introduction of some sort of a carbon pricing mechanism, what would happen? Um, and Clearly, one thing that would happen would be the price of uh, electricity would rise. Um, but what it would do is um, South Australia's relative disadvantage at the moment, that 20% that I talked about, would be turned around. So under a, um, under a, a carbon pricing um, structure, 
we would probably be relatively cheaper compared to some of the other states. And that's largely because we do have um, um, a fair high degree of renewables in other states. So, um, uh, but, but clearly, there's a number of challenges, I guess, here in us meeting our, our future club, uh, climate change goals and in trying to uh, remain um, competitive in South Australia. Um, okay, where we did find that there was um, some significant opportunity was in the, the last part of the fuel cycle, which was the, uh, the management and storage and disposal of used fuel. Um, and we found that um, South Australia has some uh, unique at attributes which give us a comparative advantage compared to other um, areas around the world. Um, our geology is about as good as it gets anywhere for this sort of activity. Uh, we're stable in a number of ways, uh, politically stable, um, seismically stable. Um, all of these things um, um, add to that, uh, that advantage. Uh, Australia in general has pretty good um, um, credibility when it comes to non-proliferation and, uh, and security of, um, of nuclear. And uh, it's probably easier to actually secure this, uh, this waste in um, South Australia, say, than in, in Japan and, and, and other uh, parts of the world. Um, there has also been um, significant um, work done around the world over the last 30 or 40 years in investigating um, uh, geological storage as a a solution to dealing with um, uh, nuclear waste. And I think there's universal um, agreement that, that that is um, the best solution, um, certainly at the moment. Um, countries like US, Sweden, Finland, Switzerland, Belgium, France, and the list goes on, uh, all have underground research laboratories and have been doing research into this for, um, as I said, 30 or 40 years. Um, and we believe that that, um, that there's potential, certainly once we look at the economics of this, to, uh, to make a significant difference to our state economy and to the um, intergenerational uh, um, opportunities that this might present as well. I'll talk more about that too. Um, so ultimately what we recommended was that we, uh, that the government look further at the, uh, the opportunity to um, d develop a, um, a used fuel um, disposal management and storage repository here in South Australia. That we remove the current legislative constraints that allow the, the, the government to actually uh, investigate this further because at the moment it, it is illegal under both Australian and, um, and South Australian law to actually even um, you know, devote further funds to, uh, to explore this. Um, and in the process, um, remove the legislative pro prohibitions, which would also let us look at things like um, fuel leasing. There we go, the time. 15 minutes, I'll power through. Um, so there's a number of key considerations clearly that uh, we, we have to satisfy ourselves with before we want to uh, do this. Clearly we need to be uh, comfortable that this is safe to do. Uh, we need to satisfy ourselves that the, the economics, the actual benefits that would accrue from this are real and that they will be uh, <coughs> uh, to us and future generations. And we want to um, convince ourselves that you know the impacts, particularly negative impacts on other industries that we already have established, are, um, are, um, are minimised or, or uh, are not materialised. So the concept that we we actually um, um, modelled is depicted here. In essence, what we uh, we modelled was a uh, a series of infrastructure, starting with a purpose-built port 
uh, somewhere in South Australia, um, connected to a, uh, an interim storage facility which would be uh, uh, relatively adjacent to that port. There would be a dedicated uh, rail line which would then run ultimately to um, the uh, deep geological storage uh, facility. Um, that interim storage facility and the deep geological storage facility in our modelling were separate, so they weren't, uh, weren't co-located. Um, we assumed that this would be um, uh, dedicated uh, facilities. We assumed that they would be separated in order to maximise, or be conservative in our, in our estimates. I mean, clearly there is some scope for these, uh, for some of these facilities to be uh, consolidated. Um, there's nothing really preventing us from, um, from also using existing infrastructure. But to be conservative in our estimates, we just assumed that it would be um, separate, newly built uh, facilities. Um, we'll talk more about the safety, and I'll come back to this, um, this diagram in a minute. But th this, is, this is the critical um, critical part of the, of the equation. Um, to answer a question uh, before, I mean, how much are we talking about here? Um, what we modelled was um, a facility that had a maximum capacity of about 138,000 tonnes of heavy metal. And that's the, the terminology used for uh, these, these fuel cells. And what we're talking about here is taking those fuel assemblies that we uh, discussed earlier and, and storing those. Uh, if we took 138,000 tonnes worth of um, these fuel assemblies and put them all together um, on Adelaide Oval, say, which we're all reasonably familiar with, um, and stack them about three and a half metres high, that's the total quantity now, um, clearly, you don't just stack it all together like that. So the actual uh, facility footprints would be um, more spread out, um, uh, depending on the solution that we uh, employed. Um, you know, the, the footprint underground would be um, an order of magnitude uh, uh, more than that. It could be uh, at the surface, you'd be talking about three square kilometres, which is about a third of the size of uh, Adelaide CBD, for example. And underground, at its extreme, it could be out to uh, 30 square kilometres, which is in the area of uh, Olympic Dam. Now, it could be a lot less than that as well, depending on the, uh, the solution that you ultimately employ. So, uh, why do we think this is uh, potentially safe, or this is safe? As I said before, the, uh, the used fuel, when it comes out of the um, um, reactor, <coughs> is hot and it's highly radioactive. Um, but it de decays uh, relatively quickly. Um, the, uh, the particularly uh, the radioactive stuff are the fission products, which are about 4% of the, uh, the, um, the mass or the volume of, of those uh, fuel assemblies. Those fission products uh, over time rapidly decay. And as, as this um, graph is showing us, um, uh, over a period of time will actually disappear. And what we're left with in the longer term are uh, these heavy byproducts largely plutonium and americium, once again about 4% of the volume, which are a lot less radioactive, but they have long half-lives. So they're, they're, they're going to be around for a long time. Um, when the used fuel comes out of a, um, a reactor, it has to be cooled down. And it's put into a cooling pond, usually at the reactor site, and it's left there for about 10 years to cool down. Uh, it's then taken out of that, uh, that cooling pond, <coughs> put into large containers, canisters, and uh, it's left to cool down naturally 
uh, for another 30, 40 or so years. And, and during that time, the radiotoxicity, uh, which is a combination of uh, radioactivity and impact on, uh, on the humans, um, decays. So at 50 years, um, we're down to about 20% of the radiotoxicity of when it came out of the reactor. Um, you can't put this stuff uh, really in the ground until it's, it's cooled down. So after about 50 to 100 years, it would then find its way into the ge deep geological storage facility. Uh, and by that, that stage, you're down to about 6 or 7% of the radio toxicity of when it came out of the, um, the uh, reactor. After about uh, three or four hundred years, um, those fission products have pretty much uh, disappeared. Um, and we're now down to a radio toxicity of, of around three percent of when it came out. Can I just ask a question? Uh, at the peak, when it's first uh, put in the storage facility, and it's severely hot, you say. Um, relative to Hiroshima or places like that, where a huge explosion has occurred, what's the re relative radiation comparison between the two? Is there a way of comparing? Well, no, they're two two totally different. Um, but in terms of the potential injury to human, to humans, order of magnitude different. So. Yeah. Um, and we'll, we'll talk in a minute about radiation in terms of um, dose to humans, and we'll try and put it into context there. Um, but but this is uh, this is uh, quite low in, in comparison to a nuclear power plant accident like uh, Fukushima. Or, uh, um, um, I guess the other point to make is that uh, after about uh, a thousand years, we're, we're down around one percent. And you know, between 1,000 and, and 10,000 years, we, we're getting pretty close to the same radiotoxicity as natural uranium. Why is that important? It's because um, to uh, mount the safety case and to convince um, the regulators that ultimately will have to approve um, one of these facilities that it is safe, um, you need to be able to show them that this, this uh, the radionuclides that are, that are in there, which are still um, hazardous to humans, can actually be uh, adequately contained. So the safety case is largely um, around trying to show three, three things. One, that the uh, that the, the nuclides are contained within the barrier system, the engineered barrier system that they're put in. And in, in essence, these fuel cycle, these fuel assemblies are put in um, uh, concrete steel or copper canisters, which are then uh, uh, welded sealed to be uh, air and gas type. Um, and it's those canisters that are then placed uh, underground. They are then surrounded in bentonite clay, and the bentonite clay basically prevents uh, water from getting in, and it prevents, if there was an issue with the, um, the canister, it prevents the radionuclides from migrating out. So plutonium, americium and the like actually largely stick to the bentonite clay. And then finally, um, so that's, if they do get out, you're trying to retard their movement with this, uh, this clay. And then finally, you would isolate it from the environment and from humans, from humans rather, by burying it you know, four or five hundred round, uh, metres in the ground. So what's the proven shelf life of the clay? The clay? Well, the, 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 the clay is, well, it would be there forever, basically. The, 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 where a lot of the, uh, the, the focus is on is on the canisters themselves. So um, depending on the, the environment that it was placed in, so the type of clay, uh, whether there's uh, the presence of water, um, you know, whether it's copper or it's steel, then over time um, they will corrode. Now it might take a couple of hundred 
thousand years for um, five or six centimetres of copper to theoretically uh, corrode. Um, but you know, it's it's that process, it's that um, that corrosion process they look at. They also look at um, a variety of scenarios, worst case scenarios. You know, what if um, something happens that uh, ruptures or damages the, um, the the container itself? And at what point in this process, what time <coughs> does does that happen? So in developing the safety caps, a couple of minutes. Five. Five. Okay. Can you just clarify something for me? Um, did you say that for the first perhaps 20 years, while this is at its most toxic, it's stored above ground? That's correct. And then it goes underground? That's right. It goes underground when it's cool enough to... Um... So, that puzzles me. At its most dangerous, we're talking about being above ground and being transported. And then after 20 years then, as it's becoming less toxic, continually on that graph, then we're going to the trouble of putting it underground. That's right. So, so in its most dangerous time, we're happy to have it transported in ships, moved on rails, and set above ground when it's extremely toxic for 20 years. That is, that is what happens at the moment. So this, this used fuel is largely in um, as I said, cools um, at power plants around the world, all over the world, mm. um, and in some places around the world, they're actually they've actually consolidated them into um, these above ground uh, dry. Well, why, 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 as it's becoming less dangerous, do we even then bother to go to an underground it's storage? Still it's getting less and less dangerous as it's sitting on the surface. Well, it's getting less and less dangerous, but it, but it's still uh, it's still dangerous over you know relatively long periods of time. Um, you know, hundreds of years is, is still a long time, thousands of years until you're getting down towards, um, you know, natural uh, uranium is still a long time. And and communities around the world are uh, insisting that this stuff is, is managed in, you know, a, a way that isolates it from, um, you know, from, from the environment. So um, that's the solution that, um, that the world is moving towards. Yeah, I'm understood that Mr. Fire because you know they have all these massive cooling ponds. So um, where are they going to be? If we're if we're the driest state, the driest world, you know, in the world, how are we going to not manage here. cooling? No, not here. We we're not proposing that there's any cooling ponds here. They're cooled where the reactors are. So all all around the world. So whether it's in the UK or in France or the US or right next to the, uh, <coughs> the nuclear power plant itself. So all, all we're talking about here is that once this is cooled down, once it is put into the, uh, the storage, uh, the dry uh, storage casks, it is brought uh, here. It is actually left above ground for a while. You know, there's a, a bunch of reasons why we do that. Um, one is an economical, uh, an economic uh, argument. Um, above ground, to basically just to cool down while we build the the, the deep. But you are recommending that we remove the existing prohibition from nuclear power generation. So if we had a nuclear power plant here, we would have to consider that issue. Well, that's right. If we had our own nuclear power um, uh, plants here, we would we would have to deal with the waste. I sort of agree with you on. I do agree that nuclear power needs at the moment it's an all-out box storage all over the place, and it's stupid in a lot of cases. And then there's a problem of the Aboriginal owners of the land who will no doubt not be very happy at the prospect that they will not be able to mm -hmm. touch go to their land for that bit of time. That's, yeah, a, that's a shame. That's, that's, that, that's, that's a shame <laughs> that, it, that it's on Aboriginal <laughs> land. I guess that's that's the okay. next discussion. Yeah, Can I, I've, I've got a couple of minutes and I've got a few slides. I'm, we're not going to be able to do this justice, and I'm sorry. Um, we, 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 we haven't. Uh, got through them all, but, but really quickly, just the, uh, the, the discussion about uh, radiation and putting it into context. Um, what this, this shows you is um, as, as, we, uh, as we exist, uh, there is natural background radiation. 
Um, that natural background radiation is in the order of, um, say, so this is the UK, for example, it ranges from about 1.5 millisieverts up to 7.5 millisieverts. Um, in Australia, the range is sort of between about uh, one and a half and four. Um, and it varies all around the world. There are places around the world where it's much higher, much higher than this. So that's just the, the, the radiation that we're all experiencing just simply by, um, by existing. Um, this, uh, well, this level here, so five millisieverts is what you would get if you uh, went in and had a chest uh, CT scan. Um, the regulatory limit that's set is uh, one millisievert, and what that says is um, that our, our activities, whatever they might be, should aim to try and keep the additional radioactive dose that people would experience uh, to less than uh, uh, one millisievert. Um, and it's just a, a health and safety um, target to aim for. What these uh, numbers here are showing what, a, what you would typically experience if you were a worker um, in a, a variety of different facilities. So that's a reprocessing facility, um, enrichment, uh, nuclear power plant, uh, low level waste repository. So we're talking about uh, 0 0.01 millisievert, which is a, a fraction of um, you know, what, what you're getting at the moment. Now, in terms of the, the deep geological storage facility that we were talking about, the, the regulatory limit that a lot of countries have set is uh, no more than 0.1 of a millisievert under all circumstances. So that's if the canisters fail, if um, you know, there's, there, there are issues with the, uh, the storage facility. For a person immediately um, above that facility, um, they should not be exposed to more than 0.1 of a millisievert. Um, and, and that's what the safety case has to try and prove. Now, in, in developing those safety cases, um, they run through a whole bunch of like, if scenarios. What if we drill into a canister accidentally? What if um, something happens and a whole bunch of these canisters are actually ruptured very early after they've been put in the ground when they're still relatively um, radiotoxic. Um, what level would you experience uh, up top? And, and most of that analysis, and it's all available on, on, on websites in the um, world, would suggest that the exposure limit is in the order of hundreds of times actually less than that 0.1 millisievert. Um, the worst case scenario would be if somebody drilled directly into one of those uh, canisters very early in the piece, then, then the, radio, the, the, the drill worker would clearly uh, be exposed to a dose above that, um, and then that wouldn't be uh, ideal, but the net effect to the uh, rest of the environment would still be below that. that Anyhow, um, and to talk about Chernobyl and those sorts of places, um, <coughs> in, the, in the area around, well, we won't talk about the actual reactor itself because it's off the scale, but the, within that 30, 30 kilometre or so around Fukushima, for example, um, the average dose limits were probably up around 20, 25 you know, millisieverts. Um, there's uh, undisputed um, agreement that once you get above um, 100 millisieverts, there could be some uh, medical uh, consequences. There's a lot of uh, debate and argument about the low doses and whether that has any, uh, any medical impact. There are arguments that says that every neutron will uh, cause you a problem. There are other arguments and uh, evidence that says it actually could have a beneficial effect. Um, but the bottom line is, you know, we, we're all experiencing um, <coughs> radiation. I'm just really going to quickly uh, skip through these, so if you give me two minutes. Um, the dollars, um, our, our, our modelling found that this was uh, significantly beneficial. Um, the modelling uh, assumptions we believe were conservative, um, I won't go into the detail, but in essence, um, you know, we could be generating 
uh, profits of over one billion, uh, sorry, over a hundred billion dollars over about a seventy-year period. Uh, if that money was uh, invested in a state wealth fund, um, and <coughs> half the interest that we earned on that was left in that fund, and the other half was spent each year by the, uh, you know, by us, um, then the, that wealth fund would grow to over you know, 440 odd uh, billion dollars over the period where we were collecting revenue. I mean, clearly the uh, compound, the magic of compound interest would see that number continue to go up in essence in perpetuity. Um, that clearly would be a huge benefit uh, for generations to come. Um, and clearly those, uh, the amount of interest that you could live off as that grows each year grows as well. So there would be an immediate benefit uh, to um, current generations, there would be an ongoing benefit to uh, future generations. Uh, we modelled a fund, uh, it was about 32 billion in a reserve fund at the end of this, that was put aside in order to decommission this facility and to uh, monitor it you know, uh, into the future. And that was separate to this uh, state world fund. Um, we could go, we just got a lot more time on that, but uh, no need for time. We had a, a very close look at the impact of, uh, <coughs> of these sorts of facilities on other industries. Clearly that was important. Um, what we found was no evidence that it has a negative impact on other industries like wine and food and, and, and the like. And we, we went around the world to try and uh, uh, uncover evidence that, that there was this negative impact. What we did find is that there is a positive economic impact, particularly on the local community that hosts it, largely through jobs and procurement activities. Um, but uh, in terms of damaging you know, wine industry or, or whatever, um, we couldn't find any evidence of that. I'd point out that most of our customers and our competitors are already nuclear countries, um, so you know, I guess they don't have a very strong argument that um, we're tainted in any way. Um, and I guess, unlike Switzerland, Finland, um, France, and everywhere else, uh, except probably the US, um, we have choice here. Um, we don't have to put this uh, just on the outskirts of Zurich. We don't have to put this within 10 kilometers of um, you know, a 40,000 per person town or under a lake, as they do in uh, Finland. Um, we could, but I guess we don't have to. And, and then that, I guess, takes us to a discussion with the, the, the wider community about citing the criteria. <coughs> I mean, there's a whole um, level of community engagement that we need to go on to determine what we, a community, thought uh, should be exclusionary criteria in establishing a site. Um, transport. Won't go into a great detail, we did a lot of research there as well. Um, in essence, uh, these are the sorts of canisters that would be moved around. They're about 140 tonne. Um, they test these by firing the missiles into them by driving, uh, have a look at the, the uh, web, you'll see a train crashing into one of these at 160 kilometres an hour. Um, essentially the train came off uh, particularly bad. Um, the, the dose limits that you get as this was transiting through uh, a community are uh, absolutely neg negligible. Um, yeah, and I guess it's been done, uh, they've been moving around the world for many years, um, and there's, there's not yet been an instance where there's been a breach or a, a leak in these, uh, in these containers. Um, so, I think the, uh, the transport issue is, is well managed. So just finally, uh, what do we recommend? Um, or what, what's, what are the next steps? Um, we recommended that the, uh, the government make this uh, report public, they've done that. 
set up a separate unit, which I talked about earlier, to actually engage more broadly with the community and explain our report. Uh, it should be independent, it should be non-partisan. Um, that was our recommendation. That that agency should prepare a draft framework. There, there clearly needs to be a lot more detail that goes into what we've been talking about. What the Commission has done is high level and conceptual. We've, we've shown that there is sufficient likelihood that this would be uh, highly profitable and could be done safely, but this is just the start. There's a lot more work to be done. And clearly, what we have noticed is that all around the world, uh, if this does not have broad community support, it won't go ahead. So we do need what we term social consent to even take this to the next step. And that's the process that the government's about to go through now, explain it, inform the community uh, in, in much more detail about what's, what's being proposed, and then pose the question, do you want to go further with this or do you want to stop? Sorry I've run out of time. Um,